Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that if we all work together, there is time to create the future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. I'm Manda Scott, your host in this journey into possibility. And as you'll know by now, part of our aim on this podcast is to shift everyone into a new set of narratives, new stories of how we are and who we could be, of changing relations with ourselves, each other, and the whole web of life. In the context of which, this week's guest is someone who is actively working on so many levels to change all of these things, to bring about that shift in narratives. As you'll hear, Marcus Raymond is a director of a European Arts Foundation, which doesn't sound nearly as exciting as it is, because this is an arts foundation with a difference. TBA21 says of itself that it is a leading international art and advocacy foundation, and it stewards the TBA21 collection and its outreach activities, which include exhibitions, educational offers, and public programming. And... The TBA21 Academy, which Marcus helped set up, is the Foundation's research centre, fostering a deeper relationship with the ocean and other bodies of water by working as an incubator for collaborative inquiry, artistic production and environmental advocacy. For more than a decade, the Academy has catalyzed new forms of knowledge emerging from the exchanges between art, science, policy and conservation in long-term and collaborative engagement through fellowships and residency programmes. All activity at TBA21 is fundamentally driven by artists and the belief in art and culture as a carrier of social and environmental transformation. All of that comes from their website. And I read it because it's really important and I couldn't have written it any better. We talk a lot about social and environmental transformation on this podcast. It's what we're here for and what we believe is essential, not just to create the future we'd be proud to leave behind, but to create any livable future at all for most of the species on this planet. We talk a lot, too, about systemic thinking, about paradigm shifts and our capacity as a species to let go of our dominant narratives and the need for somebody, somewhere, to bring together the scientists, the artists, the policymakers, the journalists, the educators, the conservationists, and do it in a way that breaks down the barriers, that lets them actually understand one another at a really deep level, and then introduces them to other cultures that think differently, that have different value systems predicated on other roots than ours, so that they can experience the different ways of doing things that will work. And this is what Marcus and the TBA21 Foundation and the Academy are doing. Here is someone who understands systemic thinking, who is applying it with depth and breadth and great heart. It's really very inspiring. And so, people of the podcast, please do welcome Marcus Raymond of TBA21. Marcus, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast, and thank you for making time out of what is now a double job, which strikes me, you seem very much to be up for filling your life very deeply and thoughtfully with meaningful things. And so, what I wanted to do was to get to understand who you are and how you came to be doing both of these jobs and how you are moving them forward. So tell us a little bit about your prehistory, so to speak. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure and, and really an honor to be on your podcast. My uh, windy road to being where I am currently um, really started Growing up in Germany, growing up in Germany, in uh, in kind of uh, central Germany, close to Frankfurt, in a place called Wiesbaden, um, to um, a German father and a Scottish mother. Yes. 
Yeah, Scotland. Um, yeah, exactly. The west coast of Scotland, uh, the the beautiful um, idyllic West Coast Bride, looking at the Isle of Arran. And um, and this is really this is an integral moment in my life. I, I uh, think um, it has subconsciously informed a lot of the mm-hmm. things that uh, have happened ever since. And that is the moment where uh, I consciously first visited um, the the um, the coastline and saw the Scottish Sea, looking at the Isle of Arran, and clearly perceiving something that is fundamentally different than any aesthetics that I had seen before. No, And this moment of the, the kind of the leaden Scottish Sea um, beating the shoreline is really something that is, that is ingrained in my uh, visual memory as um, probably the first conscious experience that I had. And you hadn't seen sea before that because you lived in a landlocked bit of the country oh that's interesting i hadn't really realized that right exactly so it's fields and and uh, and forests and urban no and so Mm -hmm. to see that uh, a space that is moving that is somehow loud that is violent uh, beating beating the shoreline uh, must have been uh, so impressive that it just stuck with me as my first really visual memory that i can uh, think back to Brilliant. But you didn't move straight into working with oceans. You had you had a, a windy career path. Tell us a little bit about how you came to where you are now. Yeah. So um, I come originally from the theatre. Uh, and uh, and so I was I was um, in the theater for eleven years as an actor. Um, and uh, theater in the German speaking region is really um, it's a repertory theater, right? So it can happen that you play, five, six, seven different plays throughout the month, but then uh, rehearse a sixth, seventh, eighth in the morning. It usually is uh, opening night is on Friday or Saturday and the new rehearsal starts on Monday. Right? So it becomes, it becomes super extractive on yourself. And at some point it might be difficult to uh, reach the next uh, threshold, no? to overcome the threshold of of really moving into a new character, into new aspects of a character, because it is it's such a rapid production that very often you just replicate. And after eleven years, I was really tired of this way of working and wanted to get out. I, I looked a little bit into film and TV, and and um, didn't like the industry around it. Mm. No, because until you have the possibility to really have a creative conversation with a director you have to get through casting and through this and through that and the other so it takes a long 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 time to really tap into these creative moments of of um diving into a story telling a story and and so this was uh, yeah i don't know um i didn't it, it it didn't suit me and the my way of working but what i remained um ultimately interested in is uh transformation this is what i'm really curious about and um this is you know this is kind of uh, retro engineering what i'm doing here i wasn't 100 percent sure that this um that this is really what was driving me but uh after the fact i can actually say this is this is at the core of things and um and that's transformation right and what are these transformative moments that we can provide what are these mom- moments of awe of inspiration of disruption of confusion of provocation where there is a brief opening where something else can happen and um, and uh, so thinking of how i can leave the theater where we are obsessed with a um, audience coming in one way and then leaving another no inspired Um, reckoning with oneself by seeing uh, a trait of oneself on stage and all of these kind of things how can i uh, remain in this in this space and um, and um, what came to mind was opening up a restaurant like like you do (laughs) obviously (laughs) but but you know this moment of of transforming material into something uh, that would then be called a meal Right, so cooking is the transformation, and then the collective cultural meeting is the transformation. Exactly, exactly. So this moment of this moment of uh, there are two moments of transformation. No, there's on the one hand the materials into a meal, and on the other hand, kind of um, a convivial moment where um, people enter into an atmosphere where they are where they are moved by the food that they eat by the wine that they drink by the by the or whatever they drink right but um but there is there is this um there is something very um 
primal in that experience. No, it is yeah. it is uh, kind of feeding into uh, into this moment of sitting around um, something warm with something warm and telling each other stories. So, and very much the the restaurant was built like that. We only had communal tables. Everything that we used as uh, for cooking, we also uh, sold. So there was a, this very idea of of sharing, of communality, of um, of uh, talking to each other. So and, and no laptops, I remember. No you laptops, saying. exactly. Yes, and and I guess now no phones, so that you have to talk to each other. We wanted to have no phones, but the you know phones just started, or or smartphones just started. So everyone was really uh, kind of enjoying the connectivity that the phone would bring to them, mm-hmm. um, and and so no phones was really difficult. No laptops was uh, was part of it. And um, and uh, so we really wanted people to connect, and it didn't matter who you were. No, you had to sit on these tables, you had to share the tables, and or you would take an entire table. But again, that would mean that you would communicate with each other. Hmm. And from that, um, actually, came the encounter with TBA Twenty One, um, because uh, at the time the organization led uh, and founded by Francesca Fittenborn-Amista. And uh, together with her chief curator, Daniela Zimmann, they were doing a lot of work in Berlin, mainly also because one of the board members, Udo Kittelmann, who was the, the director of all Berlin national galleries, um, was one of our board members, as I said. And, uh, and the meeting happened because uh, our restaurant was one of his favorite restaurants. So he would come over and over and over again. And at some point, he would bring Francesca and Daniela and they would encounter the space at a point in time, the uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof, is, which is one of the big contemporary art museums in uh, Berlin, was under reconstruction. And so they inhabited a temporary space, which was a temporary Kunsthalle, a beautiful, a very simple space, actually. And at the, at the back of it, it had um, a space for a restaurant, a cafe restaurant, but also a performance space. And um, and the foundation had acquired this temporary Kunsthalle uh, and wanted to bring it to uh, Vienna. And because we had all of these numerous encounters, um, they had asked me to, to come in and think of this space. And uh, so I started traveling back and forth between Berlin and Vienna. Um, and then uh, Vienna became a lot more... Uh, exciting than uh, Berlin, so I, tra- I spent more time in Vienna than Berlin, and um, and TBA Twenty One was really and still is to me an extraordinary organization. Tell us more about it. Tell us what it is and how it got to be what yeah. it is. So TBA Twenty One is uh, an abbreviation for Tussenborn Amista Art Contemporary, and um, it is it is a collection and a foundation. And now with the academy, it has since uh, twelve years now a research center inside but um it was it was founded by francesca tussenborn in 2002 she's the fourth generation of art collectors and uh, whereas her father very much dealt with artists that had passed away um she wanted to really engage with the creative process the process of making wanted to be very closely involved with the with the kind of the shaping and uh, the nurturing and fostering of ideas and projects and visions. And um, so, therefore, 21, as TV, uh, as Tussamon and Mr. Art Contemporary, so only contemporary artists. Um, and and uh, this was never meant to be a private collection that is kind of hidden away in homes, but it was always meant to be a private collection that was in the public. Right. So very from the beginning, there was an exhibition space, there was an exhibition program, there was a public program to unfold the works and the the thoughts that are embedded in the works and the exhibitions. Um, And um, this work that was, or the artists that um, both Francesca and Daniela were gravitating towards, they all had um, research-based practices, or a lot of them had research-based practices. So in the beginning, was the aim of the exhibitions and and all of the interactions, was that still transformation or was it... What was it? What were they? What was the overall aim of at the beginning when everything was set up? Yeah, there. I don't think there was um, necessarily a, uh, a kind of topic, a thematic, uh, um, a mandate uh, per se. Mm-hmm. No, I think the the 
the way that the collection was built was very much around artist and artistic practices that were of interest and uh, projects that were either um, too complex for the commercial space, too engaged for um, a museum context, and maybe too um, too elaborate for even for a biennale, right? And so it really became this place or this destination for the desires and visions and grand ideas of artists that um, that would otherwise not necessarily sit right. not fit anywhere else. Place. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and brilliant, and sponsor them and give them the space to really go deep into whatever it was that they were doing. Exactly. So accompany them, nurture them, develop the idea, help produce and exhibit them. And, um, and that was very much the way that, uh, uh, that we operated. Right. And, um, and so for me, we're coming into this context and there was a very, there was really a moment that, um, that, um, there was kind of an aha, aha moment. Uh, once a year, the organization would organize a seminar uh, they would happen on a very small island, the island of Lopwood, in a, um, at the time, defunct Franciscan monastery that was under construction, that was completely uh, somehow um, bombed out in the, in the war. That's how Francesca found it. Uh, she, was very, um, she was very engaged in safeguarding and restoring uh, the Renaissance paintings uh, within the siege of Dubrovnik. So wow. um, she went there, she created a restoration lab in, in the city and brought all of these experts there. She held, a, she held a conference very early on whilst the conflict was still um, ongoing uh, about art at war. And, um, and so at one point, um, the, the head of the Franciscans there um, asked her if she had ever heard of the island of Lopwood, and she hadn't. And so he took her there, and she found this incredible, incredible building, which is a monastery, but also a fortress. So, uh, because of the history history of the island, wow. uh, it was a it was a shipbuilding community, a very wealthy community, and um, so there were pirates parading up and down, and um, so there were there were uh, sieges relatively. Uh, regularly, wow. and so the Franciscans mm -hmm. built a fortress that could hold the entire um, uh, population of the island. It has huge water cisterns. It has a big medicinal garden, and so on. And so, it, within these ruins, uh, we would hold, or the foundation would organize these seminars, where they would present the thinking of the program for the next year, and invite friends, experts, colleagues to come, everyone that was invited was both presenter and audience at the same time. So there was no inside and outside. There was only inside. There was no, um, you know, press uh, allowed yeah. or anything. So it was really an intimate moment of, of sharing, uh, of being critical, of scrutiny and so on. And um, what was so extraordinary to me was that this was not a performance of openness. This was really right. open. So right. whatever the in inputs were, um, they actually had influence on next year's um, program and the thinking that was feeding into the program. So the foundation, the organization that I found was one that was extremely open and extremely willing to learn. And so fundamentally, transformation, again, is inside, no? And that's probably what I was so attracted to within that organization. Right. My gateway drug then personally into contemporary art was Walid Rand, the uh, fantastic, fantastic American Lebanese contemporary artists that um, that creates objects, creates narratives, and blends these two very often in in uh, performance lectures. And um, and Walid has a way of storytelling and combining and stitching narratives and and uh, environments together that really collapse the space of philosophy, criticality, humor, um, uh, the suspension of disbelief. Uh, and and storytelling in a in a magical way and um, coming from the theater i was obviously very attracted to this but then blending uh, really an immersive space where the visitor had the same experience as kind of the performer right because we were all in the same stage there was no division between right. stage and audience okay so you just taken down the fourth wall completely exactly and really also interested in deconstructing this idea of him as the artist, right? So, so I did then a, a lecture for him, a lecture performance for him in German. And it went so far that the audience at some point 
um, said, "What this Walid Rad character? You've made him up, no? This is like." And so, you know, I never claimed to be Walid Rad, but I was always, you know, I was a docent, an, an invigilator, facilitator, whatever, telling the story. Um, but people really, so it really blended and merged and and um, and kind of blurred the line between. Uh, facts and fiction, and that is really the 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 cre- the space that he creates. He kind of slowly um, pulls away the the carpet of reality from away from under your feet, and then so you're kind of you're questioning everything, which is a fantastic, which is a fantastic place to be. Yes, I need to talk to him anyway. Uh, uh, another podcast at another time. But so this is right at the start of the TBA Twenty One Academy. This is right at the start of my um, of my being within TBA twenty one, and then um, and then very uh, shortly after, Francesca challenges the the organization by saying, "I want to start a project that uh, operates differently from what we've done before, and looks at the environment." Right, and and this was this was. Um, rather unusual because the only the only other project that um we could find that was really dedicated and wanted to dedicate itself uh over many years time was the Anthropocene Observatory uh at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt in um in Berlin who um you know directed by uh Anselm Franke um want to work very closely together with the Anthropocene Working Group, a, a series of uh, of scientists that were looking for the golden spike to actually really um, fix the Anthropocene as a new uh, geological era, and really introduce uh, Anthropocene as a top as a term as terminology into the cultural uh, sphere, at least in Berlin and then internationally as well. Which has succeeded. It's, I mean, it's it's there now, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, the thing. Although some people are calling it the capital of scene because yeah. capitalism and yeah. humanity seem to be inextricably linked, yeah. sadly. And then, um, you know, Donna Haraway thinks about the Cthulhu scene and, and the plantation of scene. And so there, there are very, uh, there are many uh, thoughts that have been triggered by this. Um, but but I think um, the Haus der Kultur in der Welt was really instrumental in, in introducing this term. Um, and so, again, coming back to this idea of transformation, uh, transformation, change, movement, and so on, the question really became: um, How do you how do you tackle a, a question that is so big? No, a project that uh, deals with the environment. How do you do that? And um, so, thinking along those lines, uh, really, then we we came to the idea of saying. Okay, why don't we think about and with a system that is change? Why don't we think with a fluid system that really forces us to to untether us from land-based logics and binaries and linearity and so on? And by its existence, forces us to think fluidity, uh, think um, causes and effects differently and so on. So why don't we think from and with the ocean genius that was the proposition on the one hand and the second proposition was why don't we stop making art for a while and really engage with artists and uh, artists curiosities um on a long-term basis around the question of, of a what is the ocean b how is knowledge of the ocean created so what is how is scientific knowledge is how are they created how is the ocean governed what is the state of conservation and what is the what is the kind of the educational component within that? So how is it actually brought to a wider audience? And we did so by uh, bringing artists, scientists, environmentalists, legal experts together for two weeks at a time on a boat. So it was really this moment of of being together at sea. Um, for the lack of a better term, to to have a shared moment of field work, um, to to um, to talk from that on, and to work from that experience, from a shared experience. And is that run on the same basis as before, where everyone who comes is both a presenter 
and part of the audience. And there's there's that sense of everybody crossing the fourth wall and being part of a unified whole. Yes, on a very small scale. No, because on a boat, uh, this was uh, this was not a a super yacht. <laughs> no, and it was not a it was not a um, you know cruise ship. A cruise liner. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. so um, we had we had the possibility to, of bringing up to uh, ten people together. Right. And um, and so the interesting thing here was actually the the even smaller scope. No, that uh, so it was not just audience and presenter at the same time, but it was actually um, involuntarily uh, you turn into a collective. No, you turn into of course body. And were were they trying? Were they sailing the boat? Were they crew as well as everything else? So there's crew on top. No, no, there was crew. Okay. There was crew, and there was crew and um, and participants. Participants, ideally from different disciplines, as I said. Okay. And um, and the interesting thing that happened then on on this boat was that actually um, ideas never left the space, right? Because nowhere to go. No, no one can go. But um, you know, the 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 funny thing that happens is people are differently affected by being at sea. No, and uh, so a thought would be introduced uh, at dinner. Someone then couldn't sleep because either so exciting, jet lagged, whatever, 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 sits uh, uh, on deck, looks at the stars, continues thinking about this uh, uh, thought. The thought mutates in that body. It gets reintroduced the next morning in breakfast, and then it continues mutating through this collective body. You know? and, um, and so the, the really deep dives, but then also sprawling associative way of morphing these thoughts was really tremendous. And with that um, tremendous breadth, we then came to the decision that we wanted to, as an organization within the academy, um, respond organizationally to the information that was that we received, right? So saying, if we had the feeling that um, that something really called out for a scientific investigation, we would support that. If something had called out for a policy intervention, we would go down that route. If something wanted to be a conservation site, we would go down the, that route. And if aspects of that work also lent itself to become an artwork, fantastic, then we would uh, then we would act. Right, but it's not essential and you're not going to drop something if there isn't exactly. an artistic. Can I ask, was there... A spiritual dimension. Did anybody lead you or did anybody engage with asking the ocean what it thought on a, on a level of what I would call shamanic connection? Was that going on? Yes. So um, that came a lot later into into the topic, that, uh, which is quite, which was quite extraordinary. Um, when, you know, the journey started um, by the initial idea of circumnavigating the American continent. American continent um, was uh, why we wanted to do that. Uh, it's like going, it's nearly as That's long. That's a long voyage. It's a long voyage. It's nearly as long as going around the world, right? And, yeah. and, and, and extremes of weather, also extremes of danger. Exactly. That was, the, that was uh, part of the thinking. Um, obviously not really knowing there were a couple of considerations that we didn't make, right? So the coastline of Brazil, for example, is extremely long. It's um there there are massive parts that are inaccessible and so on. So we didn't we didn't quite think this through. But uh, uh, being a European organization wanting to circumnavigate the American continent, we thought it would be a beautiful metaphor to start this journey circumnavigating Iceland because Iceland is obviously on both continental shelves and um, and uh, there was a beautiful start to the journey and already then we had um, we had two sound artists with us we had a, a coral shallow water cold water shallow coral reef specialist with us we had a blue whale specialist with us um, and so on wow. and and it was extremely interesting um, and we had uh, built on the boat, uh, due to um, works that we had done before, an ambisonic sound space, which means it's a you know it's an immersive sound space, and so that uh, the the sound recordings that we did could actually be played back in this space. Wow. What happened once we had circumnavigated Iceland, went to the west coast of Greenland, then crossed the Atlantic over to Baffin Bay, and went down the uh, the east coast of the Americas? At some point, we stopped at um, the Oceanographic Institute of Woods Hole, so, um, and which is one of the two big American 
uh, marine institutes. No, there is Woods Hole on the east coast, and there is Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography on the west coast. And um, by sheer coincidence, we met a, um, a scientist there that worked on sound and that worked on um, on hydrophones. No, and uh, the work that he wanted to do or that he was doing was attaching hydrophones with suction cu- cups on whales to a um, study their song. On the other hand, really track their movement and so on. And the question was, how do you do this in an invasive, a non-invasive, non-invasive way? way uh, invasive way, no. And therefore, suction cups and uh, and all of that. But um, when we met him and we described to him what we had just been doing in Iceland, he uh, brought a number of um, scientists that work with sound or work through sound, right, um, to the boat, and we um, played to him the the recordings that we had through. The, um, through the ambisonic system. And um, what happened was really, again, the, this was a kind of an aha moment because obviously the, the artistic, um, let's say, ambition, the aesthetic ambition that an artist has and the relationship that an artist has then to a reef, to the inhabitants of a reef, knowing that at some point they become performers in an exhibition space, right, um, turns them from object to subject, no? And and uh, it's a different it's a different relationship. You make a heart connection where before it was a head connection. Exactly. Um, but in the in the aesthetic dimension and the aesthetic ambition of the recording for playback, right? Is something is so much information that the scientists could uh, all of a sudden read that they had not considered before, right? And so all of a sudden you 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 saw these this door opening up that was the potential for a different collaboration just then or rather than just to say i have information i need communication and yep. kind of having this mercantile economic exchange to say i need something from you and therefore i provide you with that but it was like this the the possibility for one and one becoming 11 rather than two sure just the enthusiasm of engagement then i can imagine the sparks that would fly but just a very quick question does it not take a lot longer than two weeks to go around iceland and then around the whole of the americas ah uh, yeah 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 so these were multiple okay. these were multiple <laughs> trips these were multiple trips right. that were organized and they were done in stages and and so on so yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, good. I was thinking you were going as a no, very fast no, boat. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. So, so carry on. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt because this is just solid gold. I and and so you're collecting all these things. Are you sending them back to somewhere in real time and and people in Germany, Venice, wherever are engaging with this? Tell us more about this. No, that was that had always um, been, you know, a question. How does actually uh, a vessel can become? How can a vessel become a broadcasting platform? So this this moment, especially because you know, kind of connectivity became a thing, social media became a thing, you know, and this uh, obsession with live and immediacy and all of that. Which, you know, later turns out in the digital space is actually not so relevant. I mean, we are now having a conversation with each other that will not be live until, you know, two weeks. Two weeks. Um, but but at the time, you know, the kind of the seduction of being in the moment and being present and um, but sadly also all the noise that that creates uh, was something that um, that was really preoccupying us. Um, but bandwidth, satellites, all of that was not, uh, we weren't quite there yet to have really this this uh, right. uh, immediacy. We did a broadcast once with BBC World um, uh, Services, Service. no, and um, and that was from Galapagos. So we had a we had a whole bunch of uh, recordings there, and we were talking about the importance of sound in environment and uh, the relationship between artists and scientists. Um, but otherwise, it was very much though, and we wanted these spaces also in the beginning not to be about production. We really wanted them to be about engagement. No, how do we how do we engage with each other, with the places that we would visit, all, obviously also the communities um, that you'd visit because there's, uh, you know, I mean, there's just questions of ethics of visiting and so on that one, one needs to think through. Then um, later on when we arrived in Oceania in the Pacific, you know, there's protocols that need to be followed It's uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So you need to, really understand the protocols. Um. What kinds of protocols? Are these, the, for the local people, the area is sacred and taking sound for example, from there? 
can be an invasion? For for example, that, but also how do you enter communities, right? Um, wh who do you ask for permission, right? That's like exactly that. Knowing where there is a, a sacred side, a protected side, a, a taboo side, whatever. How do you enter that space? How do you how do you ask permission within a community? Who do you ask for permission? What is the what is the kind of The, uh, the traditional gift that you would bring when arriving, how would you uh, present it, how would you receive it, all of, the, all of these questions that are very important in, um, in community, uh, communities that have this very strong protocol and everyone follows it. And we're talking human communities, yeah. but at some point, I would imagine, certainly I would want to have the same questions of the non-human community. Exactly, and this is where... And, and how do you ask that question? But this is yeah. where we come back to your uh, initial question. Oh, has there been a spiritual connection to, um, to that? And there was, um, there was a moment when we were uh, invited to come to a, a traditional voyaging canoe in Moorea. So there's a, there's a number of Pacific uh, and Polynesian voyaging societies Uh, there are now others, there are Micronesians and, uh, and Melanesian voyaging societies um, popping up. There, there are lots of different traditions in uh, different schools, voyaging schools within uh, Oceania and certainly in other spaces as well. But as we were in Oceania at the time, uh, we were invited to this um, voyaging canoe and uh, it was a ceremony held where uh, actually Francesca asked um, if we had permission or asked the ocean for permission um, to, um, to do this work. And, and it was quite extraordinary. It was like everyone on this canoe felt it um, because it was a super wind still day. And that's why we were invited on the canoe. The canoe was meant to be somewhere completely different. And they couldn't sail because they didn't have a motor and they didn't... Uh, they... And there's no wind. So we were doing the ceremony there. It was a super wind still day. The question was asked and all of a sudden there was this burst of wind. Oh, wow. That makes all the hairs on my arms stand out. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, but it was uh, everyone uh, kind of uh, read it as confirmation and as an affirmation that we had the permission to do this work. And uh, this became a very, very uh, strong and important moment. And and uh, it, it left this very strong connection to Oceania, to Pacific Islanders, Pacific Islander uh, communities and, and cultures, because there is There's a very different understanding of responsibility to space and place, to community, and, and thinking community and genealogies, not only human lineages, but human and more than human uh, lineages. And, um, and uh, you know, spirits, uh, ancestral spirits sh shift. They shift from human to more than human. They can be shark, right. they can be turtle, they can be, uh, they can be whale, they can be many, many, many things. But through these um, uh, human and more than human genealogies, there's obviously a very different kind of relationship to, um, to space and place. And, and to life. And to life. If, if the sharks and the whales and the turtles are your cousins or your grandparents, you treat them very differently. Exactly. And um, and not to um, you know not to romanticize that because I think this is this is somehow also now the it's a um, it's a burden that is put on uh, indigenous peoples no that there's this romantic idea of a way of life um, but but this relationality obviously makes your engagement with your immediate environment a lot more conscious right this does not mean that. Everyone turns vegan and, and all of that, but it means that uh, any everything or a lot a lot of things are understood as a gift, and this gift is meant to be uh, reciprocated and needs to be honored, right? And and so this way of engaging and and um, experiencing the world through relations rather than um, viewing everything as a resource um, just uh, demands a different way of being. Yeah, and did you find that the Caucasian people, the, the non-native people, did your experiences and ability to relate to the more than human world evolve as you circumnavigated that continent? Yes. So, I mean, um, being in and on the water is a, is a, was a major part of, of um, the program, no? And bringing people into the water outside of their comfort zones, getting their heads under the waters to actually see, to hear, 
to experience, right? What is the ocean? Um, that uh, just just the wonder, right? Of of abundance within um, the sea, which is like for many people, it's a surface. No, it's a surface it's hmm. beach. It's the you know, or, or it's a resource to be mined. Exactly, or it's a resource. We to be just mined. take all the fish because there are still some fish, and we haven't got them all yet. So you know, there's still stuff there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that changed. It changed so much in in the people that we engaged with, the people that came with us on these journeys, the, and then obviously. Um, um, spending more and more time with indigenous colleagues, no, and under getting a better understanding of relational practices, um, informed a way of being uh, tremendously. So much so that at some point in 2019, just before the pandemic, we took the decision when we opened Ocean Space in Venice as a dedicated space for this program. Um, that or this project that had become a program that now had become a, a kind of a research center within the foundation, um, and and you know the networks had grown, the the um, the approach had kind of started to solidify into a methodology, and we wanted to say, okay, good, can we find a home where we actually situate this way of working and test the hypothesis that art and culture have this potential to be. Um, fundamental drivers of transformation in communities, in ecosystems, and and more than human communities, right? And so um, that was the moment when we, in 2019, opened Ocean Space. And with that decision came the decision to abandon the the boat, um, because it comes with a number of with a number of challenges. The footprint, carbon footprint, as it was a motorized vessel, is one of them. But uh, but and and so the decision not to wanting to have two of these carbon uh, carbon heavy um initiatives because running a space is is also you know um uh, quite quite carbon intensive is the one thing but then also really the the this this idea of going to visit and what do you leave behind and what do you put into circulation and what are you taking away mm, yeah what are you taking away and what are you giving back right yeah and so we we abandoned ship and and um rethought the program the program is called the current it's a curatorial fellowship program that is always three years long it's always led by a guest curator where we kind of uh, hand over the invitation power to um to a guest curator and um and so we we um we invited barbara casavecchia who's an italian uh, independent writer and curator to reimagine the third edition of the current which she did uh, in the mediterranean and so it became a decentralized networked approach of collaboration, of, um, of research together, collective and collaborative action research, of uh, traversing the spheres of, of art. Obviously, it's always art at the core, but then activism, science, um, policy, conservation, and, and how we could bring these uh, uh, into conversation with each other, into meaningful conversation with each other. Because so much... Um, of the challenge around that is that very often in the different spheres we use similar terminology, but they mean something. Com they don't mean the same thing. Yes, I oh, guess. And the silos think they're talking to each other, and actually they're not communicating. They're not. No, and they have the they have the the um, illusion for a brief moment that they understand each other to then walk away to think, my God, this is somehow it's not happening the way that I thought it would be happening, and so it always needs this kind of facilitator mediator role which we found ourselves in and um, and in that long term engagement and commitment to these processes i think and this understanding that there needs to be translation there needs to be facilitation that's where actually meaningful encounters can happen but the question was really how do we how do we um, uh, decentralize it how do we um, maybe provide a platform that can be um, that hopefully can be um, a decolonial platform, right? Where we where we offer the the capacity of the organization, but it ne is meant to be inhabited differently. It's meant to be uh, reinterpreted in a way that is then not directed by us, but facilitated. And that also means organizationally. Again, we need to we need to learn, unlearn structures. We need to operate on different timelines. We have to have. Um, uh, a different kind of openness and that's a constant 
process of learning. No, that's a, that's uh, I don't think something that um, that we've finished. We've we're still in the middle of it. Um, we're still uh, heavily engaged with that. So now um, the the exhibition that opened on Friday, which is called "Thus Waves Come in Pairs," with two newly commissioned installations by Simon Fatal on the one hand and, and Petrit Halilaj and Alvaro Urbano on the other hand. Um, that is the result of um, this three-year research cycle on the Mediterranean, and it's actually called uh, The Mediterraneans, uh, Thus Waves Come in Pairs after Etel Adnan. So Etel Adnan, the late Etel Adnan, uh, was a fantastic, fantastic artist, uh, and for many years, the partner of Simon Fatal, and um, the entire thinking goes back to one of the last recorded conversations that the two had, uh, which was conducted by Barbara Casavecchia. And then a lot of the thinking flows from that uh, conversation and from the thoughts that the two uh, developed there together. And um, this exhibition is then accompanied by a rather elaborate public program uh, through a number of activities. One is walking. Walking has become, after sailing, walking along shorelines became one of uh, the major methodologies. Um, talking, so there's a talks and conversation series, there's a screening series, um, there's a food program, and then there's an educational program that is inside as well. And uh, so over the course of the exhibition that lasts until the 5th of November uh, at Ocean Space in Venice, um, we'll have a very, very um, active program uh, that is then interspersed with performances activating uh, the work. Um, but as this is the closure of the third cycle, we had already we have already started the fourth cycle, and the fourth cycle is situated in the Caribbean. It is um, it's led by um, a curator slash architect from the Dominican Republic called uh, Gina Jimenez Surya. Um, and she is very much thinking around the moment of emancipation or a potential for emancipation. So she's th thinking of the, of the Caribbean as a series of mountain ranges connected by water. This water is very heavily marketed as a kind of flat, calm, um, tranquil, turquoise uh, surface with white sandy... Holiday destinations. Yeah, exactly. And, and so she's really interested in kind of more natural science literacy in the space from the space but she's what she's really interested in is this is a moment of um of possibility you know and the possibility was one of other realities other futures and this moment was developed by the maroon communities all throughout the the caribbean the maroon communities usually coming together in the in the mountains you no know, either by by um slaves that were um, that were freed along the sh uh, journey to shipwrecks and then landed on islands, fled through the mountain to the mountains, met the indigenous communities, or really uh, um, slaves that uh, fled the plantations, met, uh, went to the mountains and met and lived with the indigenous communities. And through moments of improvisation, of movement, of music and and uh, uh, dance. Uh, we're able to touch upon that traumatic experience of the plantation of the colonizers and settlers coming. And then from this moment of uh, maybe unconscious touching on the trauma, really we're able to, to uh, develop different, um, different um, possibilities and different imaginaries uh, that then turned into aesthetic tools that, uh, that were able to really create these alternative futures. And so the idea is, to touch back onto those, to really think about emancipation from that space, from the Caribbean. And this may be my projection, but it seems to me that the capacity to think of alternative futures is the one that gets Western culture stuck. It is easier to imagine the total extinction of all life on Earth than an end to capitalism. But if we can imagine those alternative futures, and I was really struck early on when you were talking about the Lebanese-American artist, that capacity to get people to abandon the certainties of how the world is. Because that's the hardest thing to do. I've been trying to train people to do that for several years. And it's really hard because if you're trying to do it yourself, abandon all paradigms means abandoning even the paradigm that tells you to abandon all paradigms and it gets into a reductive cycle very quickly. But if you can be in the presence of someone who is facilitating the abandonment, 
of boundaries and paradigms so you don't have to think about it. It's just happening. That's going to change the energy of everything. And so what you're doing in the Caribbean, it seems to me, is creating seeds of potential of alternative futures for the whole world, which energetically is, is just astonishing. Has that started? Hopefully. Yeah, it has just started at the beginning of the year. We had a first meeting now um, in Jamaica where um, where Yina uh, presented her work, but she also invited a number of uh, Maroon, uh, members of Maroon communities to, uh, to that presentation, which was extraordinary because obviously, you know, coming from a contemporary art and architecture discourse, you use a very specific terminology, but, um, but fundamentally this idea um, resonated so strongly that, um, that the terminology was, was completely uh, secondary. No? It was like the idea resonated and, and the potential um, was, was clear. And so we've uh, started that project. But I think fundamentally, this is the project that we are working on. No? It's like, how do we actually create these spaces to imagine futures that we want to inhabit, right? And how do we, how does this storytelling of, like you said, no other potentials, other possibilities, other futures, bring us to a point that we that we not only want to inhabit them, but also create them collectively, right? And we can see the way to do it. Exactly. That's, yeah, the whole Threetopian project of how do I write a novel that leads us step by step through? Because we can't create them if we can't see the way through. I, th I think exactly, and 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 science is obviously in a way in a way dedicated to its way of doing things. But um, but besides modeling, it's very difficult for them to speculate, right? Mm. Or it's uh, you can't you'd lose your job. It's not what science is about. Exactly, science is about observed reality, and I'm putting those words in, in inverted commas because it's a very yeah. specific lens through which we observe yeah. reality. Although you exactly. sound to me like you're abandoning the lenses. Can I ask a quick question? Mm. I'm remembering way back. I spoke to a young man from a group called Braver Angels, which was trying to bring Republicans and Democrats together in the U.S., and he told us of a time where a group in Los Angeles, equal numbers Republicans and Democrats, and I think we're talking fifty or sixty people, had got together and spent an entire weekend discussing the meaning of the word liberty mm -hmm. and discovering that it meant completely different things to both sides of the aisle. And so then I'm thinking that you've got this place in the Caribbean where the idea is resonating hugely. Mm. And I have always thought words are how we communicate. And yet our language it's shaped the way it is. There's a lot of work done on, on the Dine, the Navajo language, mm. thinks in circles and, and nouns or verbs, and, and therefore everything is different. If you have a group of people where the idea resonates, is anybody looking at the different language that emanates in the different groups? So I'm thinking politicians and policymakers will speak differently to educators, will speak differently to artists, will speak differently to novelists, will speak differently to scientists. And yet they all come from a common idea. And if we could somehow bridge the language, mm. we could create more sense of commonality. Yeah, this is a, a kind of adjacent but separate project that we're, that we're currently building. It's around the idea of convivial conservation, right? The idea of, I think, uh, I think lately has been quite um, um, publicly discussed, this idea of green colonialism and, and actually replicating systems of violence against indigenous communities because they're mineral rich, no? And, yes. And so uh, the question of, of uh, saving the environment by killing nature. And, yep. um, and uh, so there is, a, there is a school of thought in, um, in the conservation world, which is called convivial conservation. So how do we uh, turn away from fortress con conservation, nature versus humans, to actually a cohabitation, conviviality, um, and so on. But this also means how do we redistribute the power to say this is worth protecting, this is, and how to protect, how to live with, um, how to coexist, and and also the economics of conservation, right? Because uh, usually when you have a park, there is a there is someone that uh, benefits and others that don't benefit, right? And so so it's a question of it's a power economics and and um, and communality um, thought differently. 
and um, and really um, one of the one of the methodologies that is being uh, discussed and uh, sh- soon to be tested is really participatory art practices as building uh, for building constituencies, having shared experiences amongst very diverse um, groups of constituents. So exactly as you said, policymaker as well as activists, as well as farmers, fishermen, uh, educators, artists, and so on, and having these shared participatory experiences from which then one can uh, start working and start talking to each other, right? Talking to each other and and understanding all of the complexities. Because now, especially in this, in this moment, nowhere everyone celebrates the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction um, uh, treaty that we have now, where the, the decision that was taken to protect 30% of land and sea by 2030, which is fantastic and uh, and needs to happen. But what does it actually mean, right? What does it mean for people? How do we make this equitable? How do we make this just? How do we make this fair? How do we make sure that everyone participates and benefits from that and and um and um instead of instead of you know saying to the indigenous uh, uh, communities in the amazon you can't live in the forest anymore because every now and again you you burn uh, uh, a part of the forest right so um how do we how do we think through this uh, from um uh, a lens of justice as well so yeah and how do we? Because understanding complexity seems to me it's it's the human failing. Somebody, I can't remember who, said recently that the failure to grasp the meaning of the exponential function is going to be the cause of our extinction because, because we don't get it. Complexity is complex and we're very good at linear thinking yeah. and very, very bad at complex thinking. That's question one. Question two, which I think is linked to this, is... I've been speaking recently to Simon Michaud, who used to be a mining engineer in Australia and now is advising the Finnish and Swedish governments on what a post-carbon future looks like. And mm-hmm. he has re-educated me on, on the material flow crisis. So the factoid that sticks with me and is the easiest one to encapsulate this is throughout the whole of human history, we have mined an amount of copper. I think it's 800 billion tonnes. It does The amount doesn't matter. If we were to undertake the renewable revolution, this green colonialism of we're going to drop fossil fuels and everything is going to be renewable, we would need to mine the same amount in the next 22 years, which is just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I meet a lot of people in the, let's say, climate aware space, whose focus is shifting from fossil fuels to renewables. And when I go along, go, guys, that, that's actually a logistical impossibility. Apart from anything else, if you did, it would take 10,000 years to mine the lithium. And they go, we won't use lithium, we'll use cobalt. I go, that's not the point. Mm. And so I am one trying to get my head into being bringing policymakers into this space. Mm. And you get a policymaker who's part of, let's say, EU hierarchy somewhere somewhere high up, and they're getting their heads around complexity. They're getting their heads around the implications. And they're getting their heads around the logistics. And they're going to end up in a space that is wholly incompatible with the rest of their work because you cannot go back, or I would like to see them go back to bureaucrats in the EU and go, guys, it's just not going to happen. Mm. One, it's not going to happen. Two, it, it shouldn't happen. We're going to have to have a very, very, very different future. And I would love that conversation to be happening at scale. And I, it seems to me that your project could make it happen at scale, but I'm really curious to know how that's working out in practice. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, the, the um, I think, so coming back to the first question of complexity, right? Um, uh, I think it's a, it's a question of the silos, no, that you've, that you've described earlier. Right. So what we what we see is a is a um, is a group of scientists coming together, uh, analyzing all of the knowledge that scientific knowledge that has been put out over the past years. Um, they form the intergovernmental uh, uh, the IPCC, no, um, the intergovernmental panel for climate change, which then gets completely hamstrung by politics. Uh, yeah, yeah, but first they formulated um, a report. Right. This report then gets translated into a headline. This headline is in the public sphere for two days. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, usually it's shock and awe, and um, and then it disappears uh, into the background of other shock and awe. And everybody carries on exactly as they were before. Exactly. So, 
um, obviously, to translate all of this knowledge um, into an article at some point, right? Because these reports are, are very, very, very long. So to take this report and then turn it into a headline that needs to be catchy, to then turn it into a couple of hundred words that people want to read, that's impossible. Right. Yeah. And so now more and more journalists that are engaged in that space, they obviously they engage, they're personally engaged, they dedicate their practice to that. But somehow the, the journalist, the storyteller, the communicator, the filmmaker, the, uh, the songwriter, the artist, they're not part of those conversations. They get the report and then need to translate Right, and so, and I think I think that that's a shift that needs to happen, so that complexity is embraced from the beginning and is not translated into uh, into single narratives, into linear narratives, into 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 sound bites, into sound bites, exactly. So I think that's that. I think on the other hand, that exactly like you said, this then needs to be translated into briefs for policymakers and politicians, and that's that's the same short dossier, right? And so how can you think about the entire, you know, cradle to cradle mining operations and uh, the responsibilities of where does the uh, responsibility lie no? um, for, for a plastic bag? Does it, does it lie with a fossil fuel company that takes the, takes the oil out of the ground or like in the neoliberal system with the end consumer that supposedly has the power to vote with their wallet? Right, which is fantastic. Yeah, and stop using plastic bags because you know we need a whole different world. This is the envisioning different futures. It needs to be that question needs not to be a question. Exactly, but somehow we manage to put the put the responsibility for the waste to the end user, right? And that's that's uh, um, that's fundamentally wrong, right? So so I think responsibility for actions need to be need to be re redefined. That's the one hand. But I think to understand that it is complex and therefore we need many different people to work on the same effort, right? Is um, is is one thing, um, which also means that we need to reconsider the hierarchy of values. No, so is it? Really true that scientific knowledge is is more valuable than um, um, locally situated knowledge, than indigenous thinking, uh, than cultural practices, and so on. Um, I think I think these are obviously not um, these are not equa straight equations, no. And we need to we need to uh, possibly also accept that there are differences, right? I think this, this uh, kind of the, the modernist idea of um, universal um, solutions is part of the problem, right? Because then we can scale infinitely, we can, we can take the plantation and put it onto another island and replicate it, right? And it's a, it's a question of scaling. And, um, and so um, the, the question of kind of how do we, how do we bring, make, Uh, kind of a global conversation locally relevant and vice versa is a is a difficult one. So it seems to me that it there's the knowledge hierarchy and I hear what you're saying about local and everyone I speak to says we need more localism. But one of the things that I end up wrestling with is that we have a, a global value system that is being imposed whether we like it or not. The, the Western educated industrial, industrial rich democratic weird system mm -hmm has turned up everywhere around the planet and crushed any other value system by claiming hegemony, basically. And that we do need somehow, although we need local solutions, we also somehow need to change that value system to one that, that does value the more than human world on a, on a broad scale. Absolutely. And, and then looks at the implications of that, which as far as I can tell mean that we take our, our power use and roughly reduce it to about 10% of what it is, which will mean spectacular changes in how we live, but probably a much more soulful and overall fulfilling way of living. But that seems, I, I talk to, let's say, people in the ordinary world, and their eyes glaze over by about the second sentence of that. And you seem to be able to get, infiltrate into the ordinary world, I I think I'm hearing. Are you seeing value shifts at any scale other than the 10 people on the boat? Um, I do slowly, probably too slow, I think, um, at this at this point. But 
I think you, you've just given the answer to your second question. No? What is, I mean, with all of this understanding of um, the impossibilities of immediately switching to a post-carbon uh, future, no, um, is, I guess, fundamentally a reconsideration and repositioning of our presence on this planet back to citizens from uh, consumers. Yeah. Or back to relatives, relations. It's it's yeah. all my relations yeah. are the web of life rather than all I'm concerned about is me getting a bigger car. Exactly. And that starts with the stories that we tell each other, right? I think there was this, the, there was a quite a striking um, uh, research uh, that has been done between, I think, 2016 to 2022. Um, and I might be wrong here, but I but um, I think this is the way that I remember it from 16 to 22, an analysis of all content, TV and film created within Hollywood um, in, the, in that span of time that resulted in um, the realization that 2.8% of all content was relating to climate change, climate change related terminology, climate change related technology and so on. Which means 97.2% was business as usual. Exactly. Exactly. And so so um it seems uh if we if we look now at um everyone that wants to go to space, it seems that we are becoming the stories that we tell each other. No, if you look at the, if you look at the time and the stories that were told at the time of of the formative years of uh, these guys that want to go to space, two thousand and one, all of this, right? And and so we become the stories that we tell each other. We are storytelling animals, and so therefore, culture, art, storytelling, filmmaking, music, all of this is is tremendously important in shaping the world that we want to inhabit. And uh, and so we need to tell different stories. They were watching Star Trek, and now they're trying to make it happen. And so, are you bringing in? Hollywood filmmakers, novelists, poets into your conversations so that they can begin to create the stories that will inspire, because we can't afford just to inspire the 12-year-olds now who might turn into the Elon Musk of the future. We've got to inspire the Elon Musks of the present to not be sending rockets to explode 30 seconds after takeoff, but instead to be doing something constructive in the world. Which is, again, which is, uh, you know, something that is happening right now. And it's, it's, um, it's again, relatively unfair is is to put all of the responsibility and agency on the next generation yeah yeah we can't there isn't time and yeah 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 and it's like it's so easy also ah they're going to fix it for us no they're so much more educated than we are they are yeah you know so much more emotionally literate and they get what it's like and they're not gaslighting themselves and yeah no but we haven't got time you and i know that so so we have to change the policymakers of the present, who largely, certainly in the UK, are old white men. Yeah. With with who've been brought up, it's not their fault. Somebody published the other day one of the essay questions from Eton, which uh, this year was it. The year is twenty thirty. You are prime minister. There have been food riots because of a Brexit impact and you've had to send in the army and 25 people have been killed. Please write the speech that justifies why it was both necessary and moral to have used force against these violent protesters. And this is for 12-year-old schoolboys wow. as an essay question. And once one knows that, mm. it's not surprising that if we then go on to elect these people, we get the governance that we get. But the problem is we're now, this isn't just a social and cultural problem. If it were, we could just let everything move on. And in a while, you know, there would be a new cultural change. The old colonial system would collapse and a new one would arise. But we're up against hard physical limits now. And we haven't got time to let that play out. Yeah. So what you're doing, I, I, this is so inspiring, Marcus. It seems that here, I think because I think of things in energetic terms first, and then language, and then story, and then the actions, but the energy of what you're doing feels to me that if we can amplify that energy, mm. the chances of reaching a tipping point where it ripples out, I, I'm feeling that sense of dropping ink onto water, and you get that moment of impact, and then it just goes whoosh and spreads across the surface, and you could be that drop of ink. Well, I don't think that there is a single drop of ink. No, there's there needs to be a rain of ink, sure. and and yeah. um, and so I think this is this is part of again another shift. No, from from competition to collaboration. No, and um, and and understanding that there is no single entity that can 
tackle all of the 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 these challenges and i guess this this is then the opportunity the privilege and the the power that i can that i can somehow um have and extend is is to think how does an organizational setup need to be to be collaborative to be uh, sensitive to be um, aware of power structures and, and imbalances and how do we level this playing field to um, to distribute power differently right and and so I think this is this is part of the work that um, that um, I've been asked to do by the board of TBA 21 and this is uh, how I understand this this uh, new co-appointment and on the other hand you know we are currently part of a big European project which is called the new European Bauhaus which is you know, um, already questionable in its terminology because it's celebrating a, a moment in time that uh, surely brought some development, but also, you know, just uh, made industrialization prettier. It, it was uh, a song to capitalism in a way. So, but anyway, but then the new one doesn't have to be. So exactly, and and I think I think this for me is um is is at least i want to read it like that this might be naive um and might be overly overly positive but i want to read it as a the the possibility for policymakers to understand that we need to operate differently and and the new european bauhaus was created in this moment after uh, after COVID and with the declaration of the green uh, of the European Green New Deal, and to think, okay, if we if we spend all of these money in recovery fund in restoration um, of and redevelopment or new development of of um, the European landscape, how do we make sure and what is the mechanism that uh, makes this? sustainable if not circular or regenerative that makes it inclusive to to um, safeguard uh, public space discourse and democracy and how do we how do we make it in a way that is uh, that is not just efficient and effective but also aesthetically um, um, livable and and more livable right and so this is these are the principles of the new european bauhaus um, we are one of six um, Bauhaus prototypes, which is called the Bauhaus of the Seas, that kind of proposes um, to think land and sea as a continuum. So there are seven municipalities that we are that we are um, engaging with, collaborating with seven different universities that are in these municipalities, and then um, cultural spaces. So the, it's a it's a huge collaboration between those. Then there is a series of of citizens that become the constituency that kind of thinks through the challenges in the different locales, right? And they are very different uh, groups of people. And from that, we're, we're uh, commissioning cultural interventions, usually with um, speculative, participatory, speculative, social, speculative design practices to, over the course of uh, three years, intervene in these spaces, trying to think land and sea as a continuum, trying to give the non-humans agency within the decision-making process how the how um, these spaces are inhabited, um, trying to think about new materials, regenerative materials, how to think about diets and so on, and really release um, these beautiful, speculative, radical prototypes that are usually institutionalized in exhibition spaces, how to open those doors and release them into the wild and see if they can operate on a city scale or at least on a neighborhood scale. Goodness, Marcus, this sounds so inspiring. We are running out of time. I want to come back to you in about 18 months time and find out what's happening with that, because that just sounds Please do. so exciting. I am so sad yet again that the UK is not part of the EU. But yeah, we'll get back sometime, somehow. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, we do have to stop because we're way past our hour. Is there anything else looking at? This is, I was going to ask you, looking forward, what are you doing? And that just sounds it. Any final thoughts for people listening? Or do we wrap at that? If someone wants to experience the work, uh, currently there are three uh, possibilities. Uh, in case you come to Madrid, there is um, the Wutsang exhibition of Wales at the Thyssen Museum, which is a beautiful, beautiful four-hour um, kind of meditation on the perspective 
of the whale within Moby Dick. So it's the counter perspective and oh, uh, yes. focusing on uh, on the whale hunt or the the extermination of whales. But it's really a it's a meditation on that other than human perspective. Um, if you are already in Madrid, I would encourage you to maybe take the train, 90 minutes on a train, to go to Cordoba, which in itself is a beautiful, beautiful um, historic example of interfaith coexistence and really dynamic exchange between um, Sufism, Judaism, and Christianity. And um, and within or with Cordoba, we are we've just opened up last week. We opened up an exhibition called Remedios, so all about. Um, uh, remedies, remediating, uh, mending relationships. Uh, these are works from the collection, from the TBA 21 collection. Um, or if you don't happen to be in Spain, but happen to be in Italy or want to travel to Italy, come to Italy um, because of the architectural biennial or because you wanted to see the wonders of Venice uh, in, uh, in for any other reason, please come visit us at Ocean Space where we've just opened Dust Waves Come in Pairs. You can find all of it on our websites, tba21.org. I will put that on the show notes. Yes, I, I will. And, um, and um, yeah, please come. Uh, let us know that you're there um, and we'd love to engage with you in whichever way. Fantastic. Marcus, thank you so much for coming on to the Accidental Gods podcast. And more than that, thank you for everything that you're doing. This has been one of the most inspiring conversations. I am so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing your work because it's really important that we tell each other these stories, that we know that these things are going on, that we know that these questions need to be considered, reconsidered and learned and unlearned. And, and so without, um, you know, people like you, this wouldn't be possible. We spread around the world. Thank you. And that's it for another week. And wasn't that really one of the most inspiring conversations we've had? People are doing things that will make a difference. It really feels like this is the beginnings of the ripples, and I completely get that we need lots of drops of ink. We need a whole rain of ink. But here are people who are making rain happen, and I am so impressed. And because I managed to talk right over the top of Marcus at the end, which is a very bad habit, and after four years you'd think I'd got over it, but clearly not, the link at which you will find everything, is TBA21, Tango Bravo Alpha, then 21 in numerals, dot org. And I will put it in the show notes. Just go to our website, accidentalgods.life. Go to the podcast section and you will find everything there. And thank you to Marcus for everything that he is and does, for being so wholly articulate forgetting systemic thinking, for spending time thinking, how does systemic change happen? And how can we bring it into the world? How can we sow the seeds of change? It's amazing. So if you're anywhere near Venice or Madrid or Cordoba, please do go and see the exhibitions and just explore the website. There is so much going on there. Anyway, I have no doubt that we will talk to Marcus again. And in the meantime, we'll be back next week with another conversation. And thank you, meanwhile, to Caro C for the production of the sound and for the music at the head and foot, to Faith Tillery for the website, including the search function, and for all the conversations that keep us moving forward, and for the amazing art that she creates. Thanks to Anne Thomas for the transcripts, and as ever, an enormous thanks to you for listening. And if you know of anybody else, Who wants to really get to grips with the conversations that we could be having at all levels of our being? Who wants to go really deeply into the nature of art and its capacity to change the world and to change the stories that we tell each other? Then please, do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.